Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Edelite here from Global Healthcare Resources and the Medical Tourism Association for our uh, webinar and summit on centers of excellence and direct contracting. So I'm um, excited, got some really great um, uh, panelists with us today, Curry, Wade, uh, Brad Cook, that we're gonna talk about direct contracting, centers of excellence, both domestically and international for both medical care and also for ph pharmaceuticals. So, you know, first I wanted to kick it off and share a little bit about how employers are trying to fix healthcare. Um, you know, we rebranded we our event last year as Healthcare Revolution to really focus on disruption and innovation in, you know, employers realizing the healthcare system is rigged and they've got to do something to disrupt it themselves because no one else is coming in to disrupt it because everyone is happy with how the system is run and how the costs are run. And a lot of the solutions out there are theoretical solutions that really aren't going to have an impact. But centers of excellence, or you could call it direct contracting, you can call it medical travel, you can call it medical tourism, a lot of different names, is one of the only things that when you implement it has actual guaranteed immediate savings, not necessarily long-term, short-term, instant, um, that have a huge impact. And some employers are doing it and really crushing it with the results. And I wanted to kick it off with really sharing why they're doing it and talking a little bit of also about um, Walmart is, you know, so um, most employers are self-funded. You know, I think it's 95% over 5,000 lives, um, 83, 84% over 200 employees are self-funded. And so since, you know, this is how most employers get their health care, you know, these are the employers that are going to do the direct contracting because the health insurance companies are, you know, they make their admin and their profits off of the premium. So there's really not an incentive to lower costs coming from the health insurance company side. Um, but what a lot of companies are struggling with is a variation in cost and quality from one provider to the next. Um, and, you know, Walmart, like other employers, realized they had limited control over the quality of care the workers get which also means a variation in outcomes and costs across all the healthcare providers that are treating their employees. So Walmart really focused on, uh, you know, bundled coverage, also some ACO arrangements, but the main, main factor is the bundled, um, uh, bundled treatments. And what's driving companies to start steering their uh, employees and their plan members to these centers of excellence and saying, this is where you need to go get your surgery or this is where you need to go get your medication from the surgical side, it's because they realize there's a lot of bad diagnosis is happening. You'll have people say this diagnosis, but let's just call it what it is. There's a lot of bad diagnosis. There's a lot of doctors who don't know what they're doing. There's a lot of doctors that they just love to operate, you know, so that, you know, any chance they get, they're going to operate, even if it's not necessary. There's a lot of bad outcomes happening. And then, as I said, the variability in costs and variability in outcomes. You, they could find that a heart procedure costs $200,000 um, versus, you know, it could be 90000 at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, and in reality, there's worse outcomes paying 200,000 versus the 90,000 at the Cleveland Clinic. So they realize it makes no sense and allowing employees to choose where they go for care doesn't work because the employees don't have the knowledge or expertise to choose the right surgeon and the right hospital. And of course, employees can't negotiate their own bundled prices. So now like Walmart's forcing their employees to travel for care, which I think is showing a real shift in how things are changing. Um, we did a webinar on innovation and self-funded healthcare with Willis Towers, Watson, Mercer, and Locked, and the, the, the leaders there last year. And it was great because Chris Chan, who was at Mercer's Innovation Lab, said in the future, you're going to see employers actually forcing their employees to travel for care. And it's time for a change. And within a very short period of time, we're starting to really see it. So um, one of the benefits of sending the employees to centers of excellence is they're getting um, their airfare, their hotel, their travel costs covered for themselves and a companion. In a lot of cases, they're getting their deductible and co-insurance waived, so they have no out-of-pocket expenses. Um, internationally, we're seeing where they're actually getting cash in their pocket too as an added incentive. 
So for those of you, uh, I think a lot of everyone on the, on the, the call is aware of self-funding where you know, employers are um, taking the risk with their own healthcare plans um, and uh, you know, hoping that their costs are lower so they actually save money and they're not necessarily going with a fully insured healthcare plan. You know, a TPA who's administering the plan um, is taking a fee. My background actually out of law school was working for a third party administrator that I took from a regional to a national powerhouse. We were the first ones to roll out medical tourism in fully insured and self-funded plans, and we're in, we were in Times Magazine, uh, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, all over the place. Um, but I think it's, the TPA is an integral part in since they administer the self-funded employer's health insurance program and being on board and making this work. Um, one of the most important factors that Walmart found, along with a lot of other employers, is that you know, if they work with a healthcare provider who's bundling prices, this in, in itself is a good indicator because it shows the provider is motivated to integrate all the services and have, you know, when they talk about a diverse clinical team all working around a patient's care, it's really what we call an interdisciplinary approach to a patient's care. So everybody is working together, the anesthesiologist, the surgeon, the nurses, knowing that there's a bundle. Some of these providers, have a bundle that covers complications. So everybody knows if I get this wrong, I don't get paid for all doing the work again. If I get it right, I get paid and that's it and I move on. When I was talking about, you know, some employers finding they're paying like 200,000 for a heart procedure or something, we're not even talking about the complications that come along with that when they let their employees choose. If there's a complication, what if all of a sudden that heart procedure becomes three, 400,000, half a million, because they're in the ICU. And so one of the benefits of the center of excellence model is they realize it's not only you're, you're, you're getting a negotiated fixed cost without any variability in pricing, without any variability in quality and outcomes or complications. So you can actually budget and plan, but you're eliminating a lot of the complications. You know, complications will always occur, but they're reduced and they're fixed better and faster. Um, so they found that, you know, as I said, there's, there's lower um, complication rates. They have better patient safety metrics. They can actually measure it better. Um, it's an integrated uh, care delivery system, which we call inter, you know, inter, interdisciplinary uh, care. Um, and they're willing, a lot of these hospitals are willing to create very competitive bundled prices that are attractive. Um, and so at the end of the day, the other aspect that they're getting is a concierge care so Walmart found their employees are being, you know, getting the royal treatment. They're tr being treated better than they would in the local hospitals. And so they're actually not just having good outcomes and affordability, but a better employee satisfaction and member satisfaction for the care that they're receiving, um, you know, which is encouraging more people to actually want to travel for the program because they're enjoying it. So if we look at some of the stats, that I find fascinating that Walmart came up with that was published in the Harvard Business Review is when we look at their spine um, patients who avoided surgery by sending them to the center of excellence, 54% um, were guided into other forms of treatment. So 54% of spine patients avoided surgery. So this is huge. You know, this goes back to the big bad diagnosis, big diagnosis, surgeons loving to cut people on, on, open. Um, and if you're working with a top center of excellence and a top surgeon, they're busy, they're successful, they have the money, they don't need to do the procedure. And so they kick back procedures. And so this is one of the huge hidden benefits that we've known for years but Walmart recently experienced, and now they're really sharing. And you know, if we look at their um, spine patients uh, sending to the centers of excellence, they had shorter hospital stays. So two and a half days at the center of excellence versus 2.9 days for spine surgeries at the non-centers of excellence. So this is more expense, and then more at a time out of work. Um, and at the end of the day, I also look at it from the human factor of it's more time away from your family. And the longer you spend in the hospital, the higher chance you have of catching an infection or a complication. Um, when we look at the spine patients in, in readmissions, this is this to me is amazing. At, at rate of readmission per 1,000 patients, three readmissions per 1,000 at the Centers of Excellence, 65 per 1,000 
at the non-centers of excellence when the employees choose on their loan, on theirs alone. That is a major difference. Um, and then if we look at centers of excellence with their spine patients requiring post-surgical care in a skilled nursing facility, six out of a thousand with the center of excellence, 49 out of a thousand. That's, that's amazing differentials. Um, it just shows you the quality and the outcome is just you know, dynamically different. So when they return to work faster, um, spine patients through centers of excellence, 10.6 weeks um, for a center of excellence, 13.2 for a non-center of excellence. That's almost two weeks of returning to work faster. That's critical for an employer who has a critical employee, but that also it means the employee's recovery time, their quality of life, their time around their family, the ability to play with their kids or hold their, you know, their son or daughter, it has a, you know, is is significantly impacted by where people actually go for care, and this is why they're steering people. So the other aspect, you know, they looked at was what was their per patient cost for spine surgery at a center of excellence versus a non-center of excellence. So the interesting part was it was more expensive, thirty-two thousand on average at a center of excellence versus almost you know, 29,000 as a non-center of excellence, but they found because of um, the surgeries that were avoided and the better outcomes and less complications, it actually saved the money in the long run. Um, for joint replacement, you know, like knees, as an example, one-fifth of their surgeries were avoided. So 80% of their patients had surgery, 25% were guided into other forms of treatment. Um, when a center of excellence actually looked at that joint replacement surgery. So once again, cutting a lot of expenses for procedures that don't need to be done. When we looked at the other, um, uh, shorter hospital stays, 1.7 days for a joint replacement at a center of excellence, 2.5 at a non-center of excellence. Big difference. Um, so hospital readmission rates, you'll see these are a little bit higher for the center of excellence, but 15 out of 1,000. Um, we're non-center of excellence, 50 out of 1,000. <laughs> when we look at joint replacement needing post-surgical care in a skilled nursing facility, this is pretty awesome. Zero in center of excellence per 1,000, 52 per 1,000 in the non-centers of excellence. Um, so the numbers don't lie. Uh, you know, how they're able to return to work faster after a joint replacement, center of excellence, 11.3 weeks, non-center of excellence, 12.8 weeks, huge difference. Um, now, if we look at uh, their per patient cost, you'll see the center of excellence uh, for a joint replacement was about 23,000 and non-center of excellence was about 27,000. So there was savings on the joint replacement. So who's doing direct contracting, medical travel, medical tourism, whatever you wanna call it, COEs, Boeing, Walmart, JetBlue, most large employers have implemented it. They're not all as successful as Walmart and there's multiple reasons. And I'll go into that in a second. Um, but in the future, we really expect it to be a standard benefit. I think it's, there's some really big positives to it. There's, there's also some downsides and some, some challenges to it. So, you know, who are direct, uh, who are employers doing direct contracting? HSM, Ashley Furniture. Um, these are some of the employers that are doing it outbound um, across, uh, across the globe. We did a webinar uh, a couple weeks ago, um, you know, where we shared uh, some of their stories and how much money they've saved, tens of millions of dollars sending employees abroad directly to hospitals. So there's, there's um, you know, several leading employers. There's also a huge tech company that has about 90,000 members that sends their employees to Health City in the Cayman Islands if they need heart procedures. Um, so uh, there's a lot of employers who have gotten the outbound side. They're doing it because of the high quality and the savings can be anywhere between 50 to 80% off. Um, we're also seeing insurance companies all around the world, you know, doing it. Um, every major global insurance company has um, a, uh, you know, a benefit allowing people to travel for care. Technically, that's not really direct contracting because it's insurance companies. But here domestically, Aetna, Cigna, United Healthcare, they have medical tourism divisions. It's one of the biggest areas of growth for them. Um, in trying to steer people to hospitals. In Saudi Arabia, a huge insurance company called Taiwania just signed a deal for Aetna to start directing all their insured members to the U.S. and different parts of the world for medical travel. Um, some of the biggest challenges that we're seeing in, I, I think, the direct contracting is solution providers and vendors that don't know what they're doing. 
um, meaning they're, they're really picking random hospitals or surgeons. They don't understand quality outcomes, how to choose the facilities. Um, and so they're out there marketing to employers and brokers and patients. We're sending you to centers of excellence when they're not really centers of excellence. Um, and or we're getting you second opinions from the top surgeons. They're not really the top surgeons. And there's some that are doing bait and switch. So they're saying, you know, you're gonna you're gonna get your second opinion from a top surgeon um, and your surgery, but then when you go, they feature the top doctors, but when you get or hospitals, but when you go to do it, all of a sudden they say our medical director has chosen this facility and this doctor for you, which is the best. Um, and so it's really challenging to find a quality provider who is doing this and doing this right. Um, also, all hospitals call themselves centers of excellence, um, all of them. You know, so, it, it, you know, don't think a COA is a hospital that calls themselves that. There was one hospital we met with here in Florida a couple of years ago, and um, they had a brochure, and it was every department in their hospital was a center of excellence, transplant, orthopedic, heart, pediatric, cancer um you know to me that's like going into a diner that has italian french american chinese all this stuff on the menu you, you can't be a center of excellence at everything um other challenges is some of the biggest players who put this together um have not put in an integrated system you know if you look at my last point on the slide there you, you know the most important thing is creating a seamless and easily easy experience so we've got a lot of complaints that some of the business groups that have put together solutions in this area um, you know, there's not an integrated experience. It's not seamless. It's not easy. The patient is actually told here, go to this hospital's website, go to this hospital's website, go get your own second opinion, work through the process yourself. And each intake process, each website, each form is totally different. Um, so there, there isn't that concierge aspect to it. Um, there's not really technology that makes it easy. Um, so there are definitely some gaps. So we've seen a lot of large employers implement this not realizing also how do we catch employees when they need care before they actually go to tr travel for care so we can give them that option or incentivize them properly so i think there's a there's a lot of um gaps and mistakes that they make um and then you know they don't get the utilization and the engagement from the employees and the plan members um the other aspect we're starting to see is private labeling. Um, there's players out there offering uh, direct contracting and centers of excellence, and they're actually private labeling it. So they're saying it's their service, it's their network, it's their doctors, it's not. Um, they've just contracted it and are pretending it is. Um, some are doing a focus on ambulatory surgical centers because they're cheaper. Um, that's outpatient setting. Um, so they only take people with certain morbi morbidity ratings. So they basically take the healthy patients only. So the risks are less um, and complications are less. And so, um, but they might not be the best ASCs um, or the best surgeons. And so what they're doing is, is taking a network and saying, oh, we have a hundred, we have a thousand ambulatory surgical centers around the country. So we have them right in your local city. Um, <clears throat> but just because it's cheaper, um, doesn't mean the quality is there, you know, and I would be very skeptical of, you know, someone coming to you and saying, I've got a hundred ambulatory surgical centers around the country that are the best. You know, I, I'd rather have 10 and send my employees to those 10 or those five. Um, and then how are they making the money, the vendors? Is it a percentage of savings or percentage of the surgery, a fixed fee? What if there's no surgery? <clears throat> how are they compensated? Are they incentivized or de-incentivized if there's no surgery? So you got to really think wisely. You know, we've helped a lot of employers and brokers put together these networks and make it happen. But the biggest surprise <clears throat> that everyone has found from it is that the second opinions, you're really getting a free second opinion service along with this program, is kicking back a lot of unnecessary procedures. And, and, there, and this is causing in, uh, a lot of, without it, it's causing a lot of unnecessary procedures and it's causing employers time and money. So they love the fact that you know now 20 percent sometimes up to 50 percent of procedures are being told that um it's unnecessary it doesn't need to happen uh and employees love that too um so with that i want to jump over to uh, brad cook um who uh we'd like to do a short interview then we're going to jump into um in a, another employer case study with wagstaff and how they're 
um, you know, dealing with their employees and their pharmaceuticals um, and referring them and doing more direct contracting with pharmacies abroad to really save money on their program. So Brad Cook um, is, uh, I've known Brad for, I think, almost 13 years. He's over in Costa Rica, Clinica Biblica. I would say one of the probably the top experts in medical travel that there is. Uh, Brad, thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure. Maybe you could share briefly a little bit of your background and what you do. Okay. Uh, I was born here in Costa Rica, here at Clinica Biblica Hospital, and I've been working with uh, international patients really since 1995, uh, assisting international patients that were coming to the hospital. A lot of, uh, initially, most of those were tourists. They were here for other things. And then we developed a program for medical tourism specifically. We started developing it in 2005. Uh, began getting our first patients in 2006 and have been uh, working with uh, medical travel patients ever since and uh, since about 2011 with uh, self-funded patients. Got it. And so that's uh, so that's like eight years with self-funded patients. That's a long time. Yeah. yeah, actually getting close to nine and maybe about 13 years in total. And yeah, you were one of the, the first people that believed in what we were doing and, and came down here to see the program. Yeah, I remember that. And and for anyone who's on this call, when medical tourism was first presented to me, I did say this is crazy. Uh, you know, no American would go abroad for care. Then did the research, um, you know, at, you know, and then realized there was some amazing hospitals overseas, and then started rolling it out to our self-funded clients and those clients and some of our uh, limited med mini med plans. So as more employers decide, you know, they're self-funding and they're going to, going to go do, maybe do direct contract or just refer patients to hospitals directly, whether domestically or abroad, you know, do you feel, Brad, that this is like a crazy concept and, you know, and, and does it make sense? And, and if so, why? If not, why not? Well, I mean, obviously, uh, yeah, I obviously think it makes sense, but I can see why some people initially have reservations or think it's kind of crazy. And a lot of times when we speak to companies, they're like, oh, our employees would never do this. And then they come down and they see really what's offered. They see the quality. They meet the surgeons. Uh, they see the hospitals. We work with the two Joint Commission accredited hospitals here in San Jose, Costa Rica. Clinica Biblica was the first accredited JCI hospital in all of Latin America. They see the handholding, the concierge, uh, the culture, uh, just all the handholding, you know, the, just how we go above and beyond and it's you know with the concierge but also with with quality and especially companies that are in more uh rural areas you know they say we, you know we're not getting this at home so uh they become believers quickly and most people after they've seen the program they say this is a no-brainer so so yeah how, it makes how many of those people you know so if people are listening go oh well those people must be world travelers you know they must have passports and travel all the time and be yeah. comfortable what, what's what's kind of that demographic well, you know, initially when we started, that was the, you know, the people we were attracting. Usually it was, it was the type of person that's already traveled, that already has a passport, but was self-funded, it was a whole new ball game. These were people that generally have never even been on an airplane. So obviously people were skeptical that they'd even come. And, and yeah, you still have uh, people that are a little bit nervous. I was last week at visiting some of the companies we work with and, um, you know, that we were talking to somebody and he's like, no, no, there's, you know, there's no way I can, I can get on a plane. But for most um, you know, they find it, it's an opportunity, it's a new experience and, uh, you know, they take it on, they have to go through the process and, uh, we work with them to get their passports, but, but, uh, they're coming and they're coming for the first time and they're loving the experience, the culture. So it's really something that you wouldn't expect, but it's what's really happening. So most of these people don't have passports. No, 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 no. Very, very few have passports. And it's one of the, one of the steps in the process of, you know, of getting their passports. How many employees do you think you've seen or plan members over the years from self-funded employers? Yeah, I was uh, looking at that uh, yesterday, and I'd say we're close to about 750 that we've uh, wow. had since since the end of 2011 till now, and we have That's awesome. uh, you know quite a few patients right now in the pipeline coming over the next few months as well. That's awesome. That's amazing. Um, what what have the out, outcomes been like, you know, and if you had negative outcomes, lawsuits a, a, out of all those 750 patients? No, no. Well, zero lawsuits. Outcomes have been incredible. The companies we work with wouldn't be sending the patients if they hadn't been. Obviously, we go to great care to make sure the patients that are traveling are patients that are go going to have good outcomes. We're not looking uh, to bring people down that aren't really the type of patients that should be coming uh, 
for medical travel. But outcomes have been good. Occasionally, somebody you know has to have something uh, stay a few more days. Uh, the way the program is set up, uh, it's set up so they're here long enough. So the type of uh, you know small complications you might have, you know, a small infection or different things like that, would be seen and taken care of before they go back home. So you know there have been one or two cases where a patient has had to come back, had to have another procedure. But really, out of those 750, uh, that's been, like I said, one or two, one or two cases, and at the end, they came out well as well. From the stats I just showed on Walmart's program, you think you're beating out their their results? I would think so. Yeah, and and you know we had a, a benefits manager. You know he says you know when they come to Costa Rica, it's some it's like something magical, and you know that. It, the service is just so much better than what they get. The you know there's nursing visiting them every day, et cetera, et cetera. So any little thing you know we're we're able to see right away, and the doctors are able to attend to right away. And I think that's something that patients aren't getting anywhere else. Do do you find the employees you know do any of them resent going overseas and don't want to go overseas? Like is it you know is it is it mandatory? Are all these people coming because they want? <laughs> no, no, no. The company just provides it as another option. So they have, you know, they'll get their manual and they'll have, you know, the local healthcare options and, you know, maybe even some uh, options in other parts of the U.S. But uh, this is, a, you know, the global healthcare option is just another option and they can choose it. And usually, you know, when we start with a new company, it takes a little bit of time. You have to get those uh, first few people to come and then start talking about it and start believing in the program. But once you get the first few, others want to come. And what we hear over and over again, uh, and I heard this last week, uh, people actually the lady was was crying and she was saying i just can't believe my company offers this you know it's something uh you know that i that i wouldn't have been able to have had this procedure if it hadn't been overseas because i couldn't afford it so no one resents it and what we hear from uh hr and human resource uh, i mean benefits managers is that it's actually one of the ways that they're becoming more attractive to employees in order to keep employees and capture employees that in competitive markets where maybe they're um you know there there's a challenge with that what are there a certain segment of employee em, employers or, or the type of industry that they're in that you think they're a better fit for this type of a program? Well, you know, we do a lot of uh, orthopedic, spine, uh, weight weight loss, and other types of general surgeries. But I think definitely where we found, you know, factory workers, people that are doing a lot of manual type things, where you know there's wear and tear on their joints. Um, maybe they're not uh, eating the healthiest. Uh, you know, their backs. And so definitely that's kind of the niche that we found that's the best for us. So not to say that we're not with some other companies that have other types of employees. Uh, we're seeing a lot in some of those other companies, we're seeing more types of women's procedures, hysterectomies and, and things like that. But I, I definitely think for what we're doing, and when you're looking at medical travel, you want something that's kind of, uh, I don't know if I want to use the word cookie cutter, but that you can easily say, okay, you're going to have a joint replacement that's, uh, you know, nine days in country or 12 days and, you know, day one, day two, day three, and there's not, you know, it, you, it's pretty much repeatable. And so we're looking for those uh, sort of procedures. So how is it, is it difficult? You know, you, you have an employer broker on this saying, well, this, you know, and I think the same thing probably goes for Walmart. You know, there was skepticism at first of like, how do you get your employee to get on a plane and travel to, uh, you know, another state, another region to get care? How, like, you know, this is a, this is going to be a pain to administer. You know, how would you say that is for people then saying, well, within the U.S. is one thing, doing it internationally is a totally different game. Yeah, you know, you know, I can talk about. We were up uh, last year visiting uh, one of the companies we work with, and um, and. The benefits manager from that company uh, was telling me in the morning. He's like, "Yeah, you know, I was at a, I was at the YMCA or exercising or in the pool uh, this morning, and there was a gentleman there uh, from a company that we were going to be visiting later that day. And he was going, "Hey, did you hear that these doctors are coming from overseas? They're probably going to, you know, take my kidney." And they were all laughing and joking about it, and and really, really skeptical. Like this was the craziest idea. That afternoon, we met with that other company. And we were able to present the, the the program to interested you know folks from there, and he had described what this guy was you know kind of looked like, and he was where he said he's wearing this American flag bathing suit and he can barely walk and he's uh, using I, th I think he was using crutches or at least a cane, and so we get to this other place and I see this guy with that exact description come in, you know barely able to walk and in his red 
uh, American flag bathing suit. And, uh, and he was there and he was asking all these questions like if we were insane. And to make a long story short, the program went live in January and he was one of the first patients to come. And now he's one of the biggest proponents of the whole medical travel. So, uh, you know, going from a guy that thought we were going to take his kidney to one of the biggest proponents, and that happens over and over again. So initially, it does sound kind of crazy. You have to get those first people that are kind of uh, willing to kind of go out on a, on a limb. What, but what happens is they're, they're, you know, we engage them from beginning to end, make them feel comfortable. Uh, they can see testimonials. They can talk to people that have already come. So it's just become, um, you know, so, something that for us just doesn't sound crazy. And once they start talking to people uh, who have gone, it just, you know, it, it seems like a no brainer at the end of the day. Um, you know, they travel business class and, and things like that. So we make them, you know, you know, they get a service that they're not used to. They're not used to being able to talk to their doctor when they want. They're not used to people waiting on them hand and foot. They're not used to their appointments all being pre-scheduled. And when, uh, you know, they get to the doctor's office, the doctor's waiting for them. So, you know, once people start talking about that, it just becomes part of the, you know, the, the normal uh, a, a normal option. It's not like something unusual. And in fact, for a lot of folks, the, the these doctors that they're seeing in Costa Rica become their doctors. They don't even, we have, we've had patients that have come four times for different procedures. So sometimes I think they're starting to make things up just so they can come down again. So. <laughs> well, there's the element of tourism too, right? They do, they yeah. go to an exotic destination that they otherwise may not be able to afford or visit. Yeah. And, and as part of what we do in most cases, you know, we have like a list of different uh, tourism activities that they can do. Obviously, it depends on, you know, getting the green light from from the doctor and it depends on the type of surgery. Obviously, if you're having a uh, shoulder arthroscopy or you're having a, a, a knee replacement, it's going to be different, the type of things you can do. But we do add an element of tourism where they can go see a coffee tour or, or you know, some sightseeing in some different areas. And so, yeah, they, and they experience the culture in other ways. It's just not, you know, going to tourism places, but just interacting with the drivers, with, uh, you know, the restaurants and, and all that. And, you know, uh, Costa Rica is a beautiful country. It, it's one of the places where people are always coming for, for tourism. So it's a, you know, really nice uh, benefit for employees. That's, uh, no, I really uh, appreciate uh, uh, you coming on, Brad. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to our next set of panelists and you know i'm excited to hear them present because it's really on pharmacy tourism and uh or prescription drug tourism it's something i've been actually advocating for almost 10 years that um you know is now really picking up steam with some of the leading disruptive employers offering it and it's been covered in the media a lot um and with uh, specialty drugs you know a pharmaceutical cost and a self-funded plan is going to be you know 50 percent of uh, the self-funded costs um, starting by 2020 and half of that is actually going to be specialty drugs. Yeah, and, so, and we're doing that and we're doing that as well here in, in Costa Rica. So that is something that we're seeing that's growing as well. Uh, oh, that's great. I didn't, yeah, I didn't you, even know myself. Would you like me to go off? Sure, sure. And then we yeah. come back in okay. for some final Q&A. So I'll turn okay. it over to Jenny for our next, uh, next set of panelists. Thank you so much, Brad. That was excellent. Now, um, Wade, thank you so much for um, uh, joining us as well as uh, Curry. You can, there she is. Hi. Awesome. So um, that was a really thought provoking conversation um, that John uh, just presented, not only on direct contracting and what Walmart and some of the larger employers are doing. Um, it just really is fascinating how, um, you know, over the last decade, people have changed. Um, when it relates to, you know, looking for alternative care. And so before I get started, um, I wanted to go ahead and introduce our, our next two presenters. Um, we have Wade Larson. Uh, Wade is the Chief Human Resource Officer for Wagstaff. Um, they have offices in the U.S. and abroad. Um, and Curry Willicks, Founder and CEO of Medical Travel Option which um, is a medical tourism facilitator um, company. And so we're really glad to have you both join us um, and uh, just really appreciate you joining the conversation. No, thank you for having us this morning. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Good morning. Good so, good, thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to jump right into a few of the questions um, that had been sent to me previously. 
um, when we asked people, you know, what would you like to learn about when it relates to um, medical tourism and when it relates to um, pharmacy tourism? And so a lot of our audience actually sent me questions, which is why I was able to kind of come up with this. But um, Wade, if I could start with you. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about your background and, um, you know, what made you think, let's, let's try medical tourism, let's try pharmacy tourism. What, what, what was uh, kind of, what, what compelled you to the idea? Well, you know, we, uh, I've been working, uh, working in human resources for 25 years with different companies, both from a, a traditional background, you know, working for companies and uh, also working as a consultant. And uh, let's be honest, we've, we've, all of us have been trying this game for a long time, trying to, you know, different angles and, and trying to make something work because as Jonathan alluded to, uh, nothing's working. Right, no, we're we're waiting for somebody to give us a solution, and it's not it's not working uh, at all. So uh, you know, over ten years ago, um, you know, working for a college, uh, we realized this, and and so we tried some different uh, different solutions, and and realized that if we could make some small fixes and tried incrementally, um, we could have some big results. And so we tried it with the we tried with the wellness uh, solutions, and we realized some some huge factors that that can that can be made. And so you know, incrementally, we recognize that as you do some some steps along the way and get your employees engaged, uh, these things can have some tremendous results as you start to understand that healthcare reform happens inside your organization. Healthcare reform just it, it's not going to happen globally. It's not going to happen from the government. It's got to happen from inside your yourself. And so when you start taking a look at the system itself and breaking it down as to what the components are, and you start tackling it yourself and say, what can I do? What can I start controlling? Uh, then you start to pay attention to the mechanics. And once you start to isolate each one of the mechanics, you can start to take control of the healthcare components. And so when you start taking a look at you know, pieces and parts, you start to pay attention to what's out there. And so in this particular case, you know, I actually wasn't looking for medical tra uh, travel, medical tourism two years ago, and um, I actually won a trip. This is, this is where the joy and the magic comes in. But again, if I wasn't paying attention to the mechanics, I wouldn't have even known what was out there. And uh, so um, I actually, I'm at SHRM, I'm at the National HR Conference, and I win this trip to Costa Rica, which at first I thought, you know, I, I called my wife and say, hey, honey, we're going to Costa Rica. And of course she says, uh, so is this a 90 minute presentation or an hour long presentation that we have to sit through? <laughs> And uh, uh, and it turns out I get to go see uh, go visit with a number of medical facilities down there to to take a look. They had, uh, it was through the uh, the, the Pro Procomer uh, group down there, and I get a visit with a number of hospitals. And uh, of course, this is where I'm introduced to Curry uh, with with Simo Hospital, um, and uh, and this is where I'm introduced to them. And uh, we start talking about medical tourism, which again, as a as a newly self funded group, um, you know, I, I've been with Wagstaff for about three and a half years. And uh, they were fully funded at the time. And so as we transitioned to, to, uh, to self-funded, they, of course, have some different options. And as you can break down the components and start to get control of those, then you can, you can, have some, you can explore different options. So uh, you know, transitioning to, to, to this component, um, when you start to, to look at these, these individual aspects, uh, you start to have some control. So anyway, getting to the point of the question, uh, you know, so th this is as I get uh, introduced this to uh, SEMA Hospital and, and we start talking about medical tourism as options, uh, as different solutions for, of course, surgical options. Um, that's as Curry and I build our relationship. She also introduces me to this concept that she was introduced to of pharma tourism. And that's, uh, that was, of course, compelling because, uh, you know, Jonathan alluded to, uh, to specialty drugs being 50% of the, of the total spend. Uh, no, it's it's far more than that for me. As a smaller employer, um, it's we're ranging about 70, 60 to 70 percent of our total spend is pharma, is especially pharma, and uh, and so for this concept to, uh, to to send people abroad for for specialty drugs, that was of interest to me. I knew of you know the Canadian option to go to Canada for drugs, but we couldn't get the uh, the high end drugs, the uh, the the wet drugs, the uh, Enverls, the Humeras. And so to, to hear of a solution to maybe give that a shot at 60%, 70% off of the, 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 the cost of what we're getting that, that, that had some serious interest uh, to me. So, uh, you know, listening to, uh, to this as a solution, 
um, you know, there's there's some things I'm I'm willing to give some some cutting edge things a try. And you know what? If it was crazy and it could get me sued, it probably got me uh, even more more interested. So, um, so we. Uh, uh, these are these are fine, uh, but uh, uh, you know the, so the biggest wait, obstacles that you know that. I, oh, it's go ahead. Safe to say, it's safe uh, to say that uh, that you can you can be be called a risk taker. Uh, you betcha, and especially <laughs> if, if it's going to buck the system, uh, then, then that's that's what's going to happen. Um, so uh, you know, so going down that path, you know, medical tourism has been around for a while, so that wasn't anything new. Uh, I wasn't sure I could get a lot of early buyers for things such as surgery. Now, uh, we do we, we didn't currently offer things such as uh, um, uh, gastric bypass surgery through our plan or, or gastric sleeve, you know, the, the, the bariatric surgery. So uh, looking at, at, uh, at medical tourism, but that was definitely an option. Uh, but pharma, yeah, that was definitely an option. Um, so uh, of course, the biggest challenge that you have is perception. Are the drug, you know, are, are the medications going to be good enough? Is it going to be safe? Is it going to be all that? Um, so knowing that we get it from the same, from the same manufacturers, from the same same sourcing, and we could verify the sourcing was huge. And uh, but then knowing the cost savings, and then offering it to our our employees at the uh, with, with incentives that I'll talk about here later on, uh, that that was that was the biggest uh, the biggest quid pro quo for them. Wow. Well, thank you for for that intro and kind of um, happenstance winning a trip and then realizing that there's you know understanding the mechanics I think is imp an Im important because you know you need to understand how it works before any kind of innovation can be shown to you. So I think that you know that coupled with winning the trip, um, you know, and then getting down there and actually meeting Curry and um, learning about, you know, options. I think, you know, it's just an interesting way that you came to it. So it's a good story and we appreciate you sharing it. Um, you know, Curry, uh, question for you. How have you support, supported employers like Wagstaff through the process of establishing medical tourism and or pharmacy as an option for, for their employees? Well, education is the key. Uh, they need to know what it means to travel across international borders specifically to access the type of care and type of services that they're looking to procure. They need to understand the global market. And a lot of times employers like Wade, who are progressive, very intelligent, um, have sophisticated backgrounds when it comes to being a sophisticated buyer and knowing what it's like to run, manage, and design a health plan that's going to be compliant, but yet bring costs down. And, and Wade has been consistent in um, bending the curve more down uh, rather than watching it go up. And so, you know, we're fortunate that employers, one of those later, I'm sorry, Wade is one of those employers who is going to get it. And, um, you know, Brad Cook, who was on earlier, also has stories just like that of employers who get it. They've got strong stories, they've got strong user experience, they've got um, a repeatable program. And that's what we've been doing with Wade, um, whether it's been the, the medical side, you know, taking care of, you know, the surgical, the physical needs, or whether it's on the medical side with the pharma uh, as well. So our support comes in where we make sure that there's education both for the employer as far as whatever Wade's need, whatever Wade's needs are, whatever he's looking for, and then how we step in with education for the consumer. So the employees, so that they know exactly what it is they're getting, where they're going, why that center of excellence is actually excellent, the quality, uh, the value to be had, the surgeons, what their backgrounds are, the um, the pharmacy provider. And, and so it, it, it doesn't matter, but there needs to be a, a high level of support with education. And then we also jump in with facilitating the process and making sure that the experience is is good, it's safe, it's tight, that their agendas and their schedules are, are put together, well communicated. We keep track of our people 100% through the process. We've got people on the ground who are meeting the patient upon arrival, uh, whether it's surgical or, or pharmacy. And then we've got, you know, my company who's in the background and just kind of the satellite looking at where they are, what's going on, and communicating back to the company. I know uh, Brad Cook's group is very good at this as well. 
And there's a lot of communication that has to stay super tight in order for those patients to have a really good experience um, that they will go back and talk about with their peers. Uh, Wade and I can talk about a couple of uh, patient cases coming from his population that, you know, similar to, to Brad's example, they were not going to adopt this. They were going to be naysayers from the beginning. Uh, everything they could think of to, you know, find something negative about it, but yet they go and they come back and they're huge proponents and won't stop talking about it. So it, it, it does happen. And, um, you know, my job is to make sure that Wade has what he needs to support the plan, to support the administration of that plan, to meet the compliances that he has um, from our end through the international procurement, and then make sure that his people are safe and have a good experience. Right, and I think, you know, what employees and, you know, individuals in general don't realize is you're not only saving money, but the experience of, you know, utilizing a service like this and having surgery, you're saving a, a, an enormous amount of money, but most importantly, you're treated like royalty. Um, from the minute you get off the plane, as you just mentioned, um, you've got a full itinerary. It's not like you're walking into a hospital, you know, changing into a gown, getting your surgery, and you know, and leaving. And hardly anybody's talking yeah. to you. And it's, it's, you know, it's it's such a different experience for um, users that I can understand why initially the naysayers might have their, you know, concerns, but once you've gone through it, you're literally treated like royalty. Um, you know, Curry, you create the itinerary. You have boots on the ground to welcome them. Um, they're, you know, taken to their facility and they meet the doctor and they, you know, are then put in, into a nice, you know, hotel before the process happens. And it's, um, it's such a different way to experience having a traumatic procedure, really. Sure. I mean, the experience is huge. Uh, yes. it, it will kill your program <laughs> if you don't have a good experience. And it's not just, I think when a lot of people think of medical tourism, they think of my ties on the beach. And when, when we're talking about it, you know, our, our most, our primary concern is the safety of that patient yeah. and their recovery you know, that they come back to their home better and ready to go back to work sooner. And so it, it I, I cannot say from the medical perspective that I know of any physician who has a medically approved the patient going to the beach after surgery. <laughs> you know, that's not, that's not, not been happening. my experience. Right. And so if the patient comes in early and they get a little beach time before they go into surgery, that's different. But um, if after post-surgery, you know, they're in a safe environment that's going to be sterile, cleaner, you know, something that's better for their actual recovery. Um, so we make sure that that stuff is in place. You know, there there is a, a tremendous amount of component that has to, to be in place in order for someone to travel medically. Brad uh, alluded to some of those things earlier, like getting passports, Wade people as well. Um, every one of them, Wade, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they all had to go get a passport uh, to, yep. to travel. And so that's been our experience um, too. And, you know, they need help navigating this process. And you can't just you know, tell them, hey, this is an option, and then dump it in their lap to figure it out. And so it, it's super important that the experience isn't just about what people envision. And, and I'm going to use the word, you know, they think vacation in a sense, but that's not part of it at all. The experience is who's going to walk me through this process? Who's going to stay with me? How am I going to get connected to my physician? How am I going to understand the language of the of the country that I'm going to? And that, all of that has to be bridged. It has to be covered. It has to be clear. And you need to meet the culture as much as possible of the patient from where the, they are originating from. So we do everything that we can to make that part of the experience really tight, really effective, and good for everybody that goes. 
Well, that's awesome. And and I would ask Wade, you know, what are what benefits of the program, you know, did your company see and your participants see, you know, such as maybe savings um, or maybe the experience. Well, you know, and, and yeah, you know, we could have taken this kind of a program and thought, yeah, you know, the the and this is the biggest concern that I hear from employers as I share this this concept is take a look take a look at the risks. Uh, here are the reasons why not to do it. Because uh, uh, I mean, the number one question is how did your attorneys approve this? And I'm going to tell you uh, they didn't straight up I, be, because. Uh, I, I talked to I talked to multiple attorneys. Whenever I have something risky like this, then I'll call multiple attorneys. And one of them's uh, the one attorney says this is genius, uh, but here's where to shore it up. And the other one says, "Are you out of your mind?" And I said, "I know, but tell me how to get there." And <laughs> uh, because I'm going to do it. Uh, and, and so you know we have our we, we have our, our our waivers and stuff that we send them with, and, and it's totally fine. Um, but but here's 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 how I set it up. So from from our end, I mean there, there's the employer's benefit and the employee's benefit because the employees have got to have a what's in it for them to to make this whole thing work. And so I mean Curry is my my secret weapon to make this whole thing a genius program uh, from from the customer service side because she takes care of everything, and I've handed this whole thing off to her uh, from from the service side. So uh, so. As she alluded to, I mean, they get free travel. Um, they've got the hotel for overnight stay. Uh, so they've got uh, the transport. So we send, we fly them over to San Diego, right? To, and from San Diego, all everything. Once they hit the ground in San Diego, everything is taken care of in terms of transport down to down to, to Mexico. Uh, they're in a Class A facility that's down there for the for the medical visits. Um, she sets up the visits with the doctors, with the physicians with the pharmacy with the transportation of the medicine um, uh, they have hand holding all the way down all the way back uh, all that is is taken care of um, in terms of the additional what's in it for them we pay them five hundred dollars a day that's that's a stipend that we pay for them uh, as an incentive to go down we'll call it a per diem call it whatever it's cash money we're gonna pay them 500 bucks a day as a thank you for going down and helping us out with with this uh, uh, but we also waive the deductibles. We waive co copays. Uh, well, not deductibles. I can't waive deductibles. But we we waive copays, coinsurances. Um, now, if they're on the PPO plan, there's no cost at all. If they're on the PPO, if they're on the HSA, they do have to have their deductibles met before they can participate in this. And that's just straight up how it's got to work. But once their deductible is met, um, and you know what? If that means they have to go get one fill, then they go get one fill, and then they go do this. Um, because one fill will meet their deductible, right? Um, but uh, then everything else is taken care of. No more co-pays, no more co-insurances, no nothing. We cover 100% of the cost. And so for them, uh, the rest of the year is free, free free meds for them. So we save them hundreds, if not thousands of dollars out of pocket a year in just the med costs. So they get free travel, free you know free money up to $2,000 a year per fill, right? Because it's 90-day supply that they're going down for per day. Um, so up to 2000 bucks a year, free meds, free travel, um, what's not to love, you know, from our end, what are we saving out of this? Uh, I mean, we're, we're, we're saving 60, 70%. That's after the costs. That's after the concierge fees. That's after, after the travel fees, we're still at 60, 60 plus percent. So you have an idea. I mean, we sent uh, two, we did our beta test uh, on the first two folks that we sent down, sent them down twice in one year. And we're and just two people we sent down and we're saved over $80,000 after all costs are in. That's on two people. Do the math. That, wow. And we're talking, you know, we're talking very common drugs, just common drugs. Do the multiplier effect on that one. So in May, I sent down four people on one run of peace. Yeah, I just, yeah, we just, we just took care of business in, in one month. So again, now we're a smaller employer. So larger employers, you can do whatever you want to do. Um, but uh, we're a smaller employer, and we figured this thing out. Uh, larger employers like the state of Utah, this is their primary their, their primary approach to, to doing specialty uh, meds. Uh, this is a this is a thing. This is a common thing, and, and it's the way that we make this whole thing work by understanding the mechanics. And, and and so it's nothing it's it's nothing that that anybody cannot do. It's something that we all should be taking a look at because this is how the program's got to work. Wait, what types of medications um, on the specialty front are you seeing? Because I remember you mentioning something earlier in our conversation about wet labs versus dry labs, and and what does that mean? 
the injectables, the Humeras, the Imbrils, uh, Talts, um, all the uh, all the the best stuff, right? The ones that are co that that cost me five thousand, six thousand bucks a month up here. Um, it's 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 the, it's the big name ones. Um, you know, I've got uh, I've got a handful of people, uh, relatively speak. I've got a handful of people that drive my entire specialty meds uh, for for everybody else. Um, it doesn't take that many people to start driving up these costs. So one person's going to cost you, you know, if you're lucky, only about sixty thousand dollars a year for a single med. Uh, these these are not the anti rejection drugs that can cost you hundreds of thousands, if not more, per year. Um, but uh, these are very common drugs, and chances are good that anybody is going to have these these meds um, on their on their list of uh, on the who's who's list uh, of medications. And these are very easy to uh, to secure down there through uh, through these programs. So, yeah, yeah the, the list of those. Is I mean, the amount of money that you save just you know when when you hear eighty thousand um, dollars. I mean, that's just. It's unreal for a smaller employer that's looking to curb costs and offer the best possible health care and wellness, well-being programs that you can offer. And so it just makes sense to do. I understand why, you know, some employers might have a little bit of trepidation about it, um, but knowing how it works and having the right partner, um, you know, it's, you know, even Brad said earlier, how you know, John asked him, how many lawsuits? He's like, zero. And he's been doing this for 13 years or longer. So I think, I think that you know it's just such an impressive thing that you're doing. And I, I hope employers will hear, you know, what's going on. And I think I would ask you too, Curry. You know, how did you find like the right facilities for employers like Wagstaff? You know, from a pharmacy perspective, and you know, how do you know that they're the right facilities to send people to? What's the process there? Um, sure. Well, you know, I'll start with just a very quick um, setup that going for medical, because, you know, pharma is going to fall under the medical side of the plan. So you do need to know your medical facilities as well. My longtime partner, Hospital SEMA in San Jose, Costa Rica, is is really my primary go to as, as far as the, the medical care that I'm getting. And as Brad alluded to earlier, that Costa Rica was getting into the RX game. Um, we are as well, you know, through SEMA, and we're rolling that out in the beta phase right now, but um, soon to be very full on with that opportunity. And so in 2018, my opportunity to provide RX to Wade was coming through um, Mexico which is across the border from San Diego and Tijuana. And it is in a hospital setting. Specialty pharmacies distribute and work with hospitals. That's a very important distinction. You can't just walk up um, on the street, especially in, in places where um, tourists, truly vacationers and tourists, uh, will just walk into a retail pharmacy and, and pick up their Retin-A or their, you know, whatever. Specialty drugs, are not accessible like that. And so I think that that's a big distinction that especially when the, the press hit, hit for the, the state of Utah, unfortunately the press was using images that depicted like those street pharmacies and that's not what it is at all. Um, you have to go into the hospital setting to obtain the specialty meds. They have to be under the, the written prescription of a physician. That physician has to be licensed. <laughs> and credentialed in order to write that script because that's what's going to be honored in the country of Phil. You can't just walk up and get that, number one without a prescription and number one without a, a local physician to write that script. So though knowing those things and understanding the credentialing of a specialty pharmacy, you can't just open a pharmacy. There's, I mean, it's, I have what I call the the Bible. It's a book about this thick that goes through all the the credentialing and the licensing, the um, standard that they have to follow daily, even hourly in some cases, especially with um, what Wade called the wet medications. Um, I know them as cold chain. And so those things have to meet a standard for the efficacy and the proper handling of that medication. The other thing about a specialty pharmacy is they – they receive directly from the manufacturer. There is no middleman. There is no handling of the medication and repackaging and, and all of this. So 
those types of things have to be key elements into to looking for the pharmacy who can actually handle this business. You have to have a, a pharmacy partner, which we which I do in both Costa Rica and, and in Mexico, who is able and qualified to handle this type of business. And so when you get connected with these um, these groups, you know what to look for. You've done your due diligence. You've met with the hospitals. You've met with the pharmacy. You've met with the transportation companies. You've met with all these things that do what they do best. You know, Mexico, you have to have a, there's a border crossing involved and it's a land border crossing. You have to know that process and the people that you're trusting to carry your people across the border have to know what they're doing. <laughs> We've got transportation companies who that's all they do is border crossings for medical patients, for corporate um, clients and things like that. So um, I, I want to be as thorough as I can in this short time that we have together, but also be brief knowing that there's probably a lot of questions about this, that you need to know who it is you're buying from, where the source of the medications are coming from. There's a lot of, of question about, um, as, as Wade said earlier, the validity of the medications. And so we know the manufacturers, we know the manufacturers in the U.S., we know the manufacturers who are distributing to Mexico, for example, the manufacturers who are distributing to Costa Rica. And we can, we can tell side by side that the same, they are the same, and they're all FDA approved medications. There's no um, non-formulary or, or, I'm sorry, not non-formulary, but non-FDA meds that are being uh, distributed or sold or purchased through this program. Wow. And the savings are just, I mean, astronomical. So that's amazing. It's, it's um, significant. It's really significant. Yeah. 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 Um, Wade, and that was um, a key part for us. I mean, the savings, the, the savings are huge, but the quality has to be there. I mean, it has to be verified. So. And when, when your employees have come back from this, Wade, um, you know, what has have you have you heard anything you know since it's kind of also a private thing do you do you ever hear anything from them about you know the ease of it or have they been able to communicate you know what their experience was like to you only that they love curry um no they they <laughs> they, they, uh, they, they love the experience the uh yeah, the the conversations before they leave is always about you know concerns and 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 uh, or or the unspoken concerns of is this going to be okay, is the medication going to be the same, is it going to be is it really the right stuff, are the doctors really legit, uh, and my is I mean we're only talking about five minutes over the border and anyone who has not gone into Mexico before they're like oh my gosh you know this may be the first time that that they've gone to anywhere internationally. And so there's that question of uh, what's it going to be like stepping up with my foot over the border, and so all these concerns are are, are there. And and uh, oh, I, I have a couple that are are real, um, you know, that that were really really concerned um, to the point of, of having uh, hyper anxiety, and uh, oh, wow. just it, it's it was a huge challenge uh, to the point of taking spouses, travel companions, everything. Uh, when yeah. they came back, they had such a great time. I mean, they filled their filled their their smart with with pictures the whole the whole nine yards it was it was a phenomenal experience they, they couldn't stop talking about what a great experience it was uh right down to taco tuesday you know uh and, you know, on, uh, on the other side of the border uh so oh, yeah. so the you know, the service the experience i've been to i've been to mexico well, okay tijuana i guess does count as mexico so um it, it was a great experience for them awesome and what other innovations have you kind of been thinking about um, and as far as like the future is concerned, pharmacy, medical, um, direct contracting, what is what is in your um, like kind of future plan for cost saving ways? Well, as mentioned, this is just one component of all the moving parts. So we have so many moving parts. This is. Uh, uh, th th this is just one of the pieces. We actually dabbled in in uh, international pharma before we got to this part. I have a company called Petra RX where we have international mail order sourcing uh, direct to our employees. Uh, that's been saving us thousands of dollars already for a few years, uh, where employees can just uh, send uh, get get uh, mail order direct to their homes um, for about half the price of what I was getting. Uh, so that's already been in there. Uh, telemedicine has always been a big push long before our, our latest push on telemedicine, uh, and that's been working out fine for us. Uh, this year, we were able to make the transition over to captives for our stop loss. 
And, uh, and so that's, that's where we pull, you know, pull in with like-minded employers to join in for the stop loss, uh, for, for stop loss. So that's, that's been great. Uh, and we try everything. I mean, we installed an on-site gym three years ago at the, at the get-go, um, but it's no good to have an on-site gym without a, without a trainer. So we've taken, uh, I mean, literally all of our little efforts here and there have uh, saved us. Uh, I mean, in three years, we've saved over $3 million in the bank. These are actual dollars. And, and it's not just about saving the money. This is at the same time that we have cut the employee rates in half of their premiums yeah. at the same time. So, uh, wait, wait, your your employer. I mean, tell me a little bit about the about Wagstaff. It's how many employees do you have over? Because that's a huge amount of savings. So, and you said a small employer. So, what does Wagstaff do? How many employees do you have? We're a global manufacturer of aluminum casting equipment. Uh, we have uh, we 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 have uh, just we have about 500 employees. So it's, I mean, we're not a big employer. Um, we had uh, double digit increases in, in costs for many, many years. And once we put the kibosh on that, uh, I mean, we, we, uh, we, we implemented a massive wellness program, uh, helped everybody become partners in wellness. And once, we, once you understand that uh, health insurance works the same as car insurance and have everybody become partners in, in this concept of controlling costs, that's where the beauty becomes, that, or it starts to happen. That's where the magic starts to happen. And once they, uh, but also as partners, then as an employer, you have to give it back. As the savings start to happen, you have to give it back. We're quick to share the cost increases, but we're not quick to share the cost savings. And and uh, and so what I found is uh, we can do that in two ways. Number one is as we save money, we got to give it back with uh, with the premiums. But uh, what we also do is with the HSA program, uh, it's not just about the risk of of the HSA. We also give them the opportunity to earn their entire uh, deductible back. And so we have oh, the wow. lowest deductible possible at 1550 um, and then you know times two for the family deductible, but we give them the opportunity to earn the whole thing back and their spouses. So they can earn up to $2,700 back into their HSA for them and their spouses. And that's the wow. beauty of it is once you give money back to employees, they get stingy with the money and then start making smart choices. And so, so they can earn the money back to have zero deductible we cut the premiums in half basically over the course of the last half of uh, the last three years. So we've got family to family premiums under $300 now per month. I have individual employee premiums at 10 bucks a month, um, which is you know, far cry from what they were three years ago. Uh, their, their deductibles are nothing if they do their wellness incentives, which you, you could totally get. I mean, it's, I've got, uh, I'm giving the money away. I'm giving the money away and we've got 3 million bucks in the bank and we started at zero. Uh, wow. and, and then we do these kinds of things. So um, understand when we start when we start doing these kinds of things, you know, co we, uh, coaching programs, we have, you know, we start doing these things. These are partnerships that all go to, to contribution. So so these employees come to me and they say, uh, you know, I'm not worried as much about the HIPAA. You know, yeah, we've got HIPAA intact. But when they come to me, say like, here's my problem. How can I help out? Because they're saying, right, yeah, there's some candy in it for me, but how can I help contribute to the plan? Uh, because they see the direct results of the cost savings. Right. I love that you compared it to car insurance and that, um, you know, we all are kind of responsible for this. And while, you know, the employer is taking the brunt, once you've done your proper education and they've had a great experience through, um, you know, someone like Curry, you've really made it a partnership between the employees and, and the employer. And so it does become kind of this, amazing partnership that, um, you know, and with 500 employees, you wouldn't think that medical expenses would be as high as they are. Of course they are. But, um, you know, what you've been able to do is, you know, get them into better states of wellness through your incentives. And then, of course, save money. And that's just that's just fantastic. So, well, we, we really want to thank you, um, Wade and Curry. Um, we know that you woke up very early, Wade, five o'clock in the morning from where you are today. Right. Uh, to be honest, so we are so appreciative of both of you for getting up early and being with us.